Simchat Torah, the day we're celebrating today, as you well know, and by now you know that it means, uh, what does Simchat Torah mean? Joy of the Torah. Joy of the Torah. Now, you all, of course, remember that the word Torah is uh, often, it's translated in English as the word law. So really the uh, holiday is the joy of the law. So let me ask you something. Can the, can the law be a joy? All right, let's close in prayer now, then we're done. <laughs> think about that for a moment. Just pause for a moment and think about this, because when you think about the law, you're thinking about the joyous part of the, right? But uh, have you ever seen the law of this country, you know, and, and the volumes of books and things that are out there? And you'd like to read through that? You know, my daughter is an attorney, and we have attorneys here as well. I know a number of you. And, uh, and it, it, it occurs to me, it really occurs to me, when you think about the concept of the, of the joy being a law, I ask, isn't that really like an oxymoron? How can a law, a law, a set of rules, how can that be joyous? By the way, oxymoron is an expression with contradictory words. In case you don't know what, it, what, that, uh, how, what that looks like, let me share a few of those with you. I have some oxymorons that I want to share, so see, see if you can catch these really quickly, okay? Have you ever heard of a deafening silence? All right. How about uh, virtual reality? Pretty ugly. Almost exactly. A minor crisis. An exact estimate. Listen, I work in the engineering field. This is it. The larger half. A definite maybe. Only choice. Really? A working holiday. Some of you have those. Unbiased opinion. Some of you have that. Original copies. Plastic glasses. How about a genuine imitation? Freezer burn. A rolling stop. Here in California, we see that a lot. Rolling stop. A near miss. Alone together. Old news. And this is my favorite in the whole list. Microsoft works. <laughs> Any of you who have a computer can relate to all of that. Those are examples of oxymoron. Okay, so... Um, so, what, what happens in the scripture here? When we see the joy of the law, how, you know, what exactly is that? What, is it, what does it mean in the scripture? How does it look in the scripture? You know, the word Torah appears in the Tanakh uh, some 219 times, uh, according to the translation of the New American. Eleven times, it's not called law, it's called instruction. And that really, yara, means direction or teaching or instruction. It really means, it comes from the root word of Torah, yara, is, uh, is a direction. And uh, instruction and teaching also seem to kind of catch the essence of it. But it's only, and it's even called a custom one time. But it is also called law 199 times. And when you think of what a law means, uh, regulations that are enforced by judicial decree, you better observe those, right? Uh, you know, it sounds pretty negative to me, to be fair. You know, when you read the word law and you look at the, the uh, tra English translations, it doesn't look very positive. And I'm asking the, the question this morning, is that how the Bible really looks at the law or the laws? The Mosaic laws. Is that how the scripture really does? Let me give you an example of, uh, of the scripture speaking about the law this morning. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 9 says this, so Moses 
wrote this law and gave it to the priests, that is the sons of Levi who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. Next verse, then Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the Feast of Booths, we just celebrated that, as you know, last year, what? You shall read this law in front of all Israel in their hearing, so that they may hear it, learn it, and fear it. Well, that sounds pretty heavy so far. And not only that, but be careful to observe all the words of this law. Not enough to be aware of it, to be fearing it, and so on, if you don't observe it. Now, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, says, This book of the law, this is one of my favorite memory verses, maybe it's yours as well, I don't know. This book of the law, you know, the one that's pretty scary, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. That is, you must be able to recite it and, and, and uh, be able to talk about it. But, but you shall meditate it on it day and night. Think about it. Work on it. Work it over in your mind so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Not easy. For then you will make your way prosperous. Who doesn't want to be prosperous? Everybody wants to be prosperous. Is this a, method? Is this a way of being prosperous? Think about that. What is God saying? That, that working and studying, that, that mouthing and meditating on the law will make you prosperous? How could that be? Because it takes you away from doing other things that you could earn money at. Could it be that there is so much more to being prosperous than just having money? The world rates prosperity by money. God doesn't go by the world's methods and and then he says, you will have success. Psalm 1, beginning at verse 1, says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. It's starting to sound a little more positive, isn't it? I've selected some, uh, a few uh, verses from the famous Psalm 119, that very long psalm that's in your text. Verse 77 says, Your law is my delight. If your law had not been my delight, verse 92, then I would have perished in my affliction. If there was no source of that memory of God's law, I would have been, he would have just destroyed because of, because of the affliction that, this, that the, uh, the writer of this psalm went through. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your law is truth something that I have become to value truth in life is so important because there's so much, so many things that are said and, and, and reported on that are not true. I don't want to get into fake news here. But it, it abounds around us. Your law, however, is truth. In verse 174, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. There is a connection between the law and salvation. Isn't that interesting? But I thought Yeshua did away with the law. Have you ever heard that? Didn't he, didn't he do away with the law? How about this text? This is a famous text that I... I have to tell you, this text was one that used to bother me after I came to faith because I was told that we're not under the law and, you know, and yet this text kept being a, a resource for some to say, yeah, you are under the law. And I was like, which is it? Matthew, the famous Matthew 
Do not think I, that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. This is the Lord speaking. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Well, some would say, well, that's it. He fulfilled it, and now it's done, right? There it is. There's the evidence. We're done with the law, right? Huh. This text, as I said, it used to really, I used to stumble over it because in my early days as a believer, especially when I came to the Messianic community, Back in the uh, late 80s here, and I began to be a part of uh, a Messianic congregation, there was, there was so much division over this question of law and of observance and obedience and, and uh, are we under law or not? Which laws are we under? Are we under some of them but not all of them? Or what, what about the other ones? How many can we do? What happens if you don't do them? If you, if you can do it, if you can come to celebrate on the, the, uh, the extra holiday at the end of the Sukkot, for example, on that seventh day, if you're, you're supposed to have a, you know, next day you're supposed to have a, a special Mikra Kodesh and a, a, a gathering, and, and you have to go to work. Now you're violating God's law. Now what's going to happen? Damocles' sword is going to come and cut your head off. Let me just uh, mention something right here at this point. I'm going to pause and mention. I struggled with that text until God brought before me, years later, the writings of, uh, of David Biven and Roy Blizzard, uh, who wrote not one, they wrote other books too, but this one, I, uh, this one came to me at one point in time. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you don't already have a copy of this, to consider picking one up. They're not expensive. I think they're $10, and they're available on our book table for the first uh, seven people who are fortunate enough to get there. Okay, stay seated. <laughs> Chris has got seven, and he, he can get more if needed. But this is a an amazing book that has explained so much, including the text that we just that I just listened to, Matthew 5, 17, which I did not understand properly until I read the works of these men. Now, these two men, David Biven and uh, Roy Blizzard, were believers studying in Israel. And, of course, I'm jealous of anybody who does that and can study, uh, knows, learns Hebrew well enough to be able to do that kind of thing in Israel. But they met with a, uh, another, a rabbi, professor, by the name of David Flusser. Here's David Flusser, who passed away in, in the year 2000. David Flusser was a professor of early Christianity, Second Temple Judaism, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Biven and, uh, and, uh, and Blizzard spent a good deal of time with him. And he had insights. He was not a believer. I don't think he ever came to faith. I don't know. That's between he and the Lord. But he knew more about the Brit Kadeshah, the New Covenant, than just about anybody else that I think uh, that I uh, knew studies it. He had insights that no one else had because he knew the history of the Jewish people and their, their language and studied it. it was, and he shared that with uh, Biven and Blizzard. And I want to share with you some of what came out of that time. You look at the word abolish in this text. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. When you read that, you think, what do you think of the word abolish? What does the word abolish mean to you? Do away with. Thank you. Do away with. I didn't come to do away with the law of the prophets. Well, it turns out that that's not what the text really means because this was a Hebrew idiom. Like when somebody says, you know, it's raining cats and dogs. I'd love to use that example. You don't run outside and, and look for, oh, where's the cat? Watch out, I'm going to get hit by one. You know? No, no, you know that they, that meaning raining cats and dogs means what? It's pouring rain. It's raining very heavily. It's an idiom. Abolish. In the Jewish community of that day, the word that uh, is in that Greek is, uh, is part of an idiom that was uh, 
used in the Jewish community, the rabbis of that day. And according to David Flusser, what it really means, what it really meant, it meant that uh, if somebody misinterprets the law, if a rabbi or a teacher were misinterpreting the law, they would be said to be abolishing it. And when you stop and think about that, that makes a whole lot of sense in itself, does it? It doesn't seem like it means, so if somebody misinterprets what a law means today, and they tell you, well, you know, the, uh, I don't know, uh, the, uh, you can't drive past uh, 65 miles an hour ever. And you say, well, you know, if that's the case, then even when the sign says 70, I guess I can't go. No, 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 that's your misunderstanding. You're misinterpreting what that law says. The law says 65 unless it's reasonable to go faster. You have to know more. You have to understand that or you're misinterpreting it. So if we look at the text that says, do not think that I came to abolish, and we replace the words abolish with misinterpret, here's what this text says. Do not think that I came to misinterpret the law because some might have been accusing him of that. I didn't come to misinterpret the law, but to fulfill it. What's well, starting to change the meaning of this one verse? And if you look at the last word, the word fulfill is also idiomatic in the Hebrew language among the rabbinic community of the day. To interpret the law, when somebody interprets the law properly, they are said to be fulfilling it according to the, the rabbinic community. So what, what this text really is saying is now this one. I do not think that I came to misinterpret the law of the prophets. I did not come to misinterpret, but to interpret properly. Ah. All of a sudden, this verse takes on a whole new meaning. And to prove to you that Dr. Flusser was exactly right. I went, after first learning this, reading about it, and having certain, you know, wow, I had never heard that before. I went and I looked back at the text, and I looked at, the, at what happens in the text following this verse, okay? And as I looked below Matthew 5, 17, and the verses that followed, I found no fewer than six examples of the Lord doing exactly that. Six examples that start with the words, and you can find them yourself. Don't look now because you'll, we'll lose you. Six examples of things like, you have heard that it was said, or you have heard that the ancients were told. But I say, now what is he doing? He's teaching it, he's interpreting it, properly. You've heard misteachings on it, but I'm going to give you the truth. This is what it really means. For example, he says, you shall not commit murder. And the, but Yeshua said, it's not enough to not commit murder. If you are angry with your brother, you have committed murder in your heart. So if you think that just by not committing murder, you're keeping the law, you missed it. How about adultery? You shall not commit adultery. But if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have committed adultery in your heart. You're guilty of that. You shall not divorce your wife for any reason because what Yeshua went on to say, you don't do that because if you did do that, you are, both of you are going to end up being adulterers. Why? Because in God's sight, you're still married. You don't get to divorce your wife. Remember, that was a, that was a till death do us part type thing. You don't get to do that. Oaths. You shall not make an oath and swear by the temple. He said, don't make an oath. Simply say you're going to do something. Let your yes be yes. And your no be no. Anything more than that is unnecessary. 
keep your word about what you say. An eye for an eye. You know, that scripture, ayan tachat ayan, chain tachat chain, is the Hebrew word meaning give an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But what it really means, some people say, oh, well, if somebody tears out your eye, you have a right to get theirs. You know, it's got to be, that's fair, that's just, right? That's not at all what he was saying. The, uh, that was meant to be a limiting thing. You, if somebody takes out your eye, you're not to take out anything more than his eye. That doesn't mean you have to do that. That was a limit to what you could do for somebody. Doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. For example, he said, if somebody demands that you, and they were under the Rome at the time, if somebody says, carry this for one mile, do I have to do that? Well, what if you carried it two for them? What, what, would that, what would that do to them? And this one. The scripture says you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, right? No. Yeshua said you shall love your enemy and pray for those who use you in a wrong way. Pray for those who do wrong to you. This is the right teaching. This is what Yeshua came to interpret correctly. And that's what this text is all about. Why did Yeshua uphold the law? Well, first of all, he understood it much better and how it applied. And there's a lesson here for all of us in that. The book of Galatians has one verse that I want to share with you, and then we're going to close. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Messiah. You realize that? The fact that you can't fulfill the law, God knows that. And he made a provision. The law was meant for you to come to the grips with the reality that no matter how hard you try and how much you do, you are not going to keep the law the way God had commanded it. I don't think there's any man here who hasn't struggled with lust at some point in their lives. Some more than others. It's hard in this world. Listen, every place I look... There's a billboard or a TV ad or something else waving before my eyes. You have, to, you have to turn your head away from that because it's almost like you've got to keep your eyes closed when you walk because that's the, way, that's the way it works in this world. But the law has become our tutor to remind you that you can't do that. You need forgiveness, atonement for, your, for lusting and for all the things that you do wrong. And that is, the law leads you to Messiah so that you can be justified by faith. Because you couldn't do it by yourself. Anybody who thinks they can, I say, good luck. You've already failed before you get started. Before you got out of the dugout, you've already struck out. And you know, when you think of it that way, Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah, can be a joy after all. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word which, uh, which constantly renews our mind and our thoughts and gives us a right perspective on how we are to, to view this world and our lives in it. Lord God, we thank you for this wonderful day that we can celebrate. We're here, Lord God. What a gift it is to be here. Lord, thank you again for all the, the uh, things that you do for us. And Lord God, may you be with us and go before us and may we follow you, Lord God, in joy, in the, in the joy of, uh, of just knowing you and uh, recognizing that our salvation comes from you, not from us. And we give you all the praise and give you all the glory. B'Shem Yeshua Mishikenu, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Let's stay.